Hello and welcome to Story Radio, the podcast for readers, writers and lovers of short stories everywhere. Happy Halloween. Today we're listening to Underground Places by Marie O'Shea. Eighteen hundred hours. We'll start with Flytrap, says Flo, then move on to some of his other work. You can talk me through what's important, okay? Sure thing, I say. She fiddles some more with her microphone, then flicks her eyes across the paintings. I look away, not wanting to appear too anxious, too invested. As the moment stretches, I see that a bulb in one of the spots has blown. A pulse like the flutter of small wings starts up under my left eye. The pressure of mounting this show has taken its toll. I feel it in the drag of my bones, the sag of my jaw. Saw it in the mirror earlier as I slapped on concealer. Currents of hot air send ripples through the overhead banner. Emblazoned in scarlet, underground places stands out like blood against the stark white background. The sight of it swaying there like a rallying flag to battle pumps adrenaline through my veins. Over the fire door the exit sign glows green. Green to go. The thought grows in my head. Get out while you still can. Then, like a reassuring auntie, the evening sun streams through the top window, illuminating pillars of floating dust and turning them golden. I take a deep breath and allow myself to see this as a sign, a celestial thumbs up, that everything will play out just the way it's been planned. Underground places, she says. It's an intriguing name, an interesting concept for a... Yes, I say, jumping in. De Barra's early work is intensely introspective, almost like he's beaming a flashlight deep inside the collective unconscious. And we're off. I'm morphing into the woman she's come to interview. Founding member of the collective. Someone who speaks with authority about art and artists. Curator of a show she likes the name of. 1810. The door swings open and Frida shunts a wedge under it with the side of her shoe. Ready to rock and roll, she says in a stage whisper. They're getting restless. In a few minutes, guests will filter through from the foyer. Conversations will hum and champagne will be drunk. When I glide my fingers over my skirt, I feel the crackle of static. This is typical de Barra, I say, pointing an electric-charged finger at the first of the paintings. An empty street, hazy sunshine filtering through boughs of cherry blossom. Then we look more closely and see this barbed wire web. Nasty, she says, effecting a shudder. Very nasty, I say. The theme of entrapment crops up again and again in de Barra's work, often as a subtext, a veiled hint. Here, it takes centre stage. The whole point of this painting is the web. It's menacing, dark. I don't like it very much. He painted it around the time he split up with his wife, pretty much around the time we hooked up. His technique is interesting, she says, the wide brush strokes, the way the paint is layered to suggest shadow. I nod. I'm about to say something about the 1980s and the years he taught on the course I dropped out of, make some salient point about him being experimental without actually vomiting, when a glass shatters in the foyer, followed by a peal of laughter. Moments later, three young women emerge through the door. One of them strikes off to look at something on the far wall, and the others follow. Frida extracts herself from a group of artists and saunters over. Just wondering where this lot came from, she says. Did you invite them? No, I say, arranging my mouth into a smile. (laughs) Best check with Anna. I make a thing of looking around for Anna. She's out in reception, says Frida, trying to get hold of the guy from security. We roll our eyes. 
I tell Flo that the camera's on the blink, it's been a day when things have gone pear-shaped, and that Anna is my niece. Then we skirt past a handful of guests. We'll come back to this one, I say. Which one is that? She says, glancing at the catalogue. Underground Places of the Women, I say. Ah, yes, she says, examining the image of a scared-looking woman standing on the edge of a train platform. Wasn't that sold recently at auction? No, I say. You're thinking of Shorelines. This one comes from his private collection. We hover for a moment. Someone in beige linen expounds on the symbolic resonances of the painting, how attuned Debarra is to the feminine psyche. I smile brightly, inanely at no one in particular. Flo removes her glasses, rubs at them with the end of her scarf, then holds them up to the light. This is something of a new departure for you, she says, representing such an established male artist. I lick my lips and tell her that Debarra's exploration of submerged liminal spaces raises important questions about the place of women in the art world. A howl of laughter from somewhere nearby throws her off scent. We turn and see the girls positioned in front of underground places, just as I have instructed. Across the gallery, Frida catches my eye and raises her glass. The complicity of the gesture spurs me on. Let's move on, I say, making my voice smooth as butter icing. Melinda's next in line. Melinda is a seated nude, oil on canvas. Hair twisted into a French knot, head slumped forward, beautiful in that offbeat art house way he couldn't resist. This is the most intimate of the Melinda series, I say. She takes a step back, eyes narrowed. Breathtaking, she says. I blow my cheeks out and nod. Melinda was in a different league. I knew she was bad news the day she signed up for still life. 1840 Now for something quite different, I say, standing aside so she can move closer to the next painting. Picture herself sitting at the table, dressed and elegant, waiting for dinner, then seeing an eye pressed against the window, slick and dark, shot with a single fleck of amber. The eye of a conger eel, or a basking shark. Again, this is unsettling, I say. The realisation that this is an underwater scene, that the diners are being observed as they eat. His early work is very potent, she says. It feels like he's mining a particularly rich seam of subconscious imagery. It's interesting what he did, taking the dream and twisting it. When I looked through that window, I had seen shoals of herring, the sea shot with gold, teeming with life and possibility. I remember lying beside him, ink stains on the orange nylon bed cover, the two-bar heater valiant against the chill of rising damp, the slurp of his coffee as I told him the dream, the sound of his pen scribbling it down. In bygone times, they'd have burned you as a witch, he said eyes soft and flirty, clutching my two hands as if he personally would have pulled me out of the flames. He might even have had a tear in his flirty yellow eye as he told me this. It makes me laugh to think he called me his muse. Twenty years old, sticking my finger into the heavenly socket and feeding him the surge. He had no idea of what that cost. The terror I felt weeks later when I dreamt of that underground platform. Hearing the cries of the women huddled there in darkness. I thought I might be waiting for a train. The force of what was shooting through my body felt like a train. I woke to find him sitting beside my hospital bed. The flowers he brought had been put in a vase, the aroma of the roses mingling with the clinical smell of antiseptic. He asked me if I was sore and squeezed my hand. I did the right thing, he said. I was too young for the responsibility of motherhood. 
When I told him the dream, he said I was brave, that women were brave. Then he said he had a meeting, otherwise he'd stay longer. He avoided my eyes when he said that. He left it a couple of weeks before telling me about Melinda. Flo clears her throat, snapping me back to the moment. What interests me, she says, is your connection with the artist. There is a delicacy to the way the question is phrased. De Barra has been very generous, I say, clasping my hands to my heart, giving us this unique access to his early work, allowing us to reappraise his legacy in this way. Such a pity he's not able to be here. Her eyebrow arches. Health reasons, I say. He's not been well. Frida taps me on the shoulder and I turn around. I'm sorry, she says. Anna needs you. There's been some mix-up about the schedule. Really? I say, looking up at the ceiling. Go and restore order, she says. I'll look after Flo. 1855. The tinkle of their laughter carries as I make my way across the room. It is punctuated by the tap of my heels on the parquet floor. A quick scan around the room tells me everything is in place. The sheer recklessness of what we're about to do makes my head spin. The part of me that isn't shooting across the galaxy like a dark and fallen angel must proceed across the hall, sit at the front desk and wait for the fireworks to kick off. When the clock hits seven, the glass smasher will take a blade from her bag and gouge underground places diagonally from corner to corner. The damage she inflicts will be irreparable. There will be panic. Someone, no doubt, will scream. Then Frida will step in, ordering people to stay calm, shepherding guests to the fire exit and counting them whilst the girls hit the road in a car driven by Anna's boyfriend. Later, after the guests have left and the police have left and we've recovered from the awful, terrible shock, from the wanton destruction of the exhibition's signature piece, we'll go home kick off our heels and drink a toast. Then I'll ring and tell him about the last dream, how I stumbled down that same set of stairs, stood on the train platform and waited with the women. Only this time, it was different. There were voices, warm, rich voices, which cut across the darkness, singing in words I didn't understand. After a while I started to hum and, strange as they were, words flowed out of me and I lost myself in the harmonies. Then, as the light of morning filtered through the eye of the tunnel, the singing stopped and a woman stepped forward. Even though she was covered over, I knew straight away who she was and my breath stopped short. Something was stolen from you a long time ago, she said handing me a knife. You have to take it back. I'll give him a moment to absorb the significance of this. Then I'll mention Flo. Suggest he gives her a call. Offer his version of events before everything spirals out of control. Then I'll hang up. That was Underground Places, written by Marie O'Shea and read by Catherine Allison. The producer was Martin Nathan. If you're enjoying our podcast, don't forget to subscribe for free so you can listen to a new story every month. Goodbye. <laughs>